Welcome to Pastor Bill's Classroom. We are in our study of the Corinthian Letters, Lesson 29, entitled, Blueprints for a Happy Home, Part 3. Hello, welcome back to our midweek study, uh, studying the book of 1 Corinthians. We're all the way down in chapter 7, and in fact we've gotten to chapter 7 and used it as a jumping off spot to consider this whole issue of marriage, in particular labeling this little short excursion, um, the uh, blueprints for a happy home, and we're in part three of that. We've looked at the blueprints in general for a happy home, and went to Genesis chapter two for that, and then we went over to Ephesians chapter five, looking at specific blueprints for the husband, and we're going to be continuing in that vein today. So if you've got a Bible with you, if you don't, stop this video, get one. This is a Bible study. This is not a listen to Pastor Bill study. This is study your Bible. Uh, my goal is not to make you dependent upon me. My, Bible, my goal is to make you understand the Scripture so you don't need me. And, uh, of course, the need never runs out because they always get new Christians and all that. But anyway, that you turn into a teacher yourself. Uh, that is certainly the goal. So, so Ephesians chapter 5. And uh, we, we saw last time our Christianity is no better than we are when we are at home uh, in our marriage. It's where the rubber meets the road. Uh, we've considered, like I said, this overall blueprints. We're going to continue in the vein of looking at the blueprints for the husband. And uh, his role is a tougher role. Because, uh, remember, the, the marriage is intended to mimic, to, to give a skit or play of the ultimate relationship, which is the relationship between Christ and the church. So in, in the role, in the, in the skit called marriage, the husband plays the role of Christ. That is a tougher role. That is its higher responsibility. And so we, we began looking at that last time. What does loving your wife look like? Well, we saw last time it looks like being the savior of the marriage. Is that okay, husband? And you don't get to vote on this. We don't get to decide what marriage looks like. In fact, that's our problem. We've gone off and turned marriage, life in general, uh, into something that it isn't because we're going by a t totally different set of blueprints. The Bible tells us how these things are supposed to look because the one who created us, the one who created marriage, the one who created our, us and made us the way we are, is God himself. He alone holds the blueprints. We have to look and see what, and obey what the blueprints say or we can't expect it to work out. And that's the reason why it's not working because we're using a different set of blueprints. So based upon the blueprints that God has given to us, the husband, one of, the, one of his chief roles is that of Savior. Can, can we describe you that way, sir? And your relationship to your wife and your relationship to your kids, are you being the savior, not the dictator, not the abdicator? Uh, and we saw last time also that the husband is to lead the wife in the same way that Christ led the church. How did he lead them? I gave you the example of Christ washing the feet of his disciples. Washing their feet. And he says what? Go and do likewise. The husband, not the wife, sets the tone. Whatever tone he sets, it's going to be the tone of the church. Of, I'm sorry. It's going to be the tone. It was true for Christ and the church, so it'll be true for the husband and the family. The husband sets the tone. There's no way around it. So now we're ready to consider uh, new ground today, and before we do that, we need to pray together, of course. So let's, let's spend a few moments here in prayer. God, we thank you that you hold the keys, and forgive us, God, when we haven't been coming to you. We've been thinking somehow we've got it figured out, and we read a bunch of books that really aren't based on your word, and and maybe we try really hard uh, based upon the, the conditions and norms of our, of our culture. But we haven't come to you, the creator of all things, uh, the master of our lives, the master of marriage, and we haven't submitted ourselves to you. So Lord, we want to do that. We humble ourselves before you. We confess, God, that you alone know. Only you can fix us. Only you can make our marriages and lives right. And so we ask God you to preside over our study together and that you be glorified through the results. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, so the role of Christ, what does that mean? Number one, as we saw for the husband, it means Savior. Number two, here's the new stuff. Another detail of blueprints we read down in verse 25. Let's, let's take a look at that. In fact, let's, let's just back up and read from verse 22 down to verse 25 just to introduce biblically our study. Here's the whole, the all, overall blueprints, wives and husbands, uh, here in chapter 5 of, of Ephesians. Verse 22, wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife. As Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. There you go. There you go. There's your role. You've got to be the Savior. Sorry, you don't get to create this. You don't get to define it for yourself. 
But as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be subject to their husbands and everything. Husbands, here we are, blueprints. Love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. You're not just the Savior in the skit called your marriage. You're also the sacrificer, sacrificing yourself. I, again, I submit to you the harder role is that of the husband. And, and let me just say this, and I'm not trying to downplay the role of the wife in any way. Obviously, submit yourself to your husband. That's tough. That's hard. But let me just say this. if, Ma'am, if you have a husband who lays down all of his rights to see that you're exalted, to see that you're lifted up, is it going to be hard to submit it to a guy like that? No. You see, the problem, gentlemen, that our wives have with submitting to us is that we're selfish little twits. <laughs> we're, we're one more kid that she's having to raise. And that makes it tough on her. That's why submission is tough. Submission is tough because we're not playing our role correctly. Play your role correctly sure makes it easy on her, or I should say a lot easier on her. She's going to have to obey the Word of God just like you will. But, but again, here, here what's, what's your role? I am, am I, I am willing to give my, up all my rights to meet the needs of my wife. Are you? You need to be able to say that. The basic premise of individual society that we live in today is please yourself, right? Please yourself. How's that worked out in our culture? We've been pleasing ourselves now for, for many, many years. Uh, so so how's, that, how's that come together? Well, we're the most educated we've ever been. We're the most well-funded we've ever been. We're the most well-traveled we've ever been of this generation. We're also the most displeased, the most discontented generation. I'd say the, the statistics show that please yourself, if you can make a broad generalization of it, if, if, if you decide to please yourself, the please yourself generation, if anything, is determined that if you seek to please yourself, you will never be pleased. Jesus predicted this. Here's what he said. Look at this. Matthew 16. For whoever wants to save his life, that's please yourself, take care of yourself, focus on yourself, be all about yourself, be about your needs, your priorities, it's you first, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You can do that, but here's what's going to happen. Anyone who wants to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life will find it. It's a system of relationship to Christ, a system of relationship for your your family, for your marriage. I mean, you're going to lose your marriage if that's what you're about. I want to make sure that I'm getting what I'm supposed to be getting in here. Well, (laughs) you will never get it. You'll never get it. Come in there and say, it's my job to sacrifice all my rights for the sake of my wife. You're going to have, you'll love that. You'll love the results. The Word of God cannot be broken. When our main concern is our needs, our our happiness, our time, our please me culture, your life will slip right through your fingers. It just will. Look look at verse 28. We we read verse 25. Look at verse 28. So husbands ought to also love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. You want to really meet your needs? Love your wife. Directly in, in your direct implications upon your happiness. Love your wife, you're going to be happy. Don't love your wife. Don't sacrifice for her. Well, <laughs> you're going to be, I can tell you why you're miserable. You set the tone, which means if you live selfishly, she'll have to. She has to. It's hard to submit to a dude who is totally self absorbed. I mean, you're asking too much of her. Love your wives. You set the tone as yourselves. And it's the same as loving yourself. You're, you're going to help yourself so much, if you will. So, so, so you're the sacrifice. So what is your wife's need? So I'm laying down my own needs for the sake of my wife's needs. I'm laying down my own rights for the sake of my wife's, wife's uh, rights. So, so what, what does that look like? What are the needs of your wife? Well, I'm not married to her. And uh, I'm a student of my wife. But, and you need to be a student of yours. But I can tell you in general of three specific needs that every single wife needs her husband to be. Need number one, she needs you to be committed to Christ and that you will set the tone for the spiritual things in your marriage. She needs you to be this. 
That's, that's called being a leader. She needs you to lead in spiritual things. Every wife needs this. That's your role, by the way. So if you're playing Jesus in the skit called your marriage, was Jesus the leader or was he the follower in spiritual things? <laughs> Easy answer. So are you to be a spiritual leader in your home. Not an option. Not an option. She should not be the one in the marriage who has to lead out spiritually or get the family ready for church or lead in prayers or lead in walking with God. I'm not saying she can't be your equal. I'm not saying she can't be better to you in things. But she ought to have to work at that because you're leading out. Because you know it's your responsibility. You should be more serious about your spiritual life than any other pursuit of your life, including your job. Remember, as husbands and fathers, we set the tone. As the father goes, so goes the family. This time of year, we have a lot of uh, fires down in Mexico. They burn sugar cane and other things. It's wintertime. Well, it doesn't really go, go to winter so much in Mexico. But no, that's, it's the time of year they burn a lot of stuff. And then we get a south wind, we get this haze here in South Texas. And uh, smoke, you know, fine particle stuff. It affects those with asthma, with breathing issues, with sensitivity to, to stuff like that, lots of allergies and other things. And so it, you think of it in the same way. If there's a spiritual smog in your relationship, you're to blame, sir. You're to blame. Because you're the leader. Rises and falls on leadership. Let's go back to verse 25. It says, for husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, notice, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her. Notice, he's meeting her needs. Cleansed her. He knows what her needs are. And he's meeting those needs. Having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word that he might present himself to the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless. Notice, he's totally focused on her, not himself. That's your role. That's your job. That's what a husband does. She needs you to meet her needs spiritually. She needs you to meet her needs in, in the sense of uh, she needs a man of character, a man who's above reproach, a man who's above board, who's honest, who's genuine. Your, your wife should be able to say, I trust my husband. He's going to do the right thing. Can she say that? I said, or does she have to follow you around like one of her kids, not really sure how you're going to do or what you're going to say? It's not right. Again, you set the tone. Provide for your family an example of how to live. It'll be far more valuable than anything material that you can supply to them. Far more valuable. If you break the rules, then you will own it. And don't say something ignorant like, I was just doing this for my family. No, you were doing this for yourself at the expense of your family. She needs you to be a man of character. Number three, just three. These are big. This is a biggie. She needs you to meet her emotional needs. You say, yeah, Pastor Bill, that's the toughest thing. I'm just not very emotional. Well, that's probably why she's more emotional, because she's at least trying to fill in the gap. When God created Eve, he didn't create anybody. He created another human being equal to Adam, but not the same as Adam. Two Adams, somebody's not necessary in this relationship. Your wife is not going to be like you for all the right reasons. And the least of those issues is physical emotionally, the way she handles things and processes things is different than you, not any worse nor better than you necessarily, just different because you need that. She needs you to be different too. Each of you coming at it from a different direction because it takes two to make it, to make it happen. That's the reason why God put us together. She needs you to meet her emotional needs. She's not like you, not at all. She brings to the table what you are missing and vice versa. Verse 29, notice there's an important word here for us here, gentlemen. For no one ever hated his own flesh. Let's go back to verse 28. Husband ought to love also, ought to also to love his own wives, his own bodies. For he who loves his wife loves himself. Verse 29. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it. That's an important word. Just as Christ also does the church. So again, Jesus sets the standard of the role we are to play as husbands. And one of the things that he did is he nourished her, took care of her, and cherished her. What's that mean? If I take care of my wife, okay. But what does it mean to cherish? Well, here's, here's, here's the way to think of it. Cherish means to recognize the value of something like it's a jewel, a fine china. 
needs to be protected, needs to be exalted, needs to be set up where it can be all that it can possibly be. That's your job for your wife, to set her up. Here's, here's, here's some things that are true about your marriage, or I should say this, in, in the relationship between the two of you. Sir, husband, you almost certainly are not the prettiest one. Can we say that one for sure? All right, that's a safe bet. You probably, in many, many cases, maybe in most cases, are not the smartest one. You may not have the best ideas. Oh, I do because the Bible says that I'm the leader. No, that's not what leadership is. Leadership just means you take responsibility for this mess. doesn't mean you know anything. It just means when the Lord comes around and says, who's responsible? You have to raise your hand and say, me. It doesn't matter who comes with the ideas. In many cases, your wife is better than you. She may even be a better breadwinner than you. Your position, your role is to exalt her. Make her be, cause her to be, everything that God has created her to be. God has set that responsibility for you. Cherishing her. Cherishing her, perfecting her, and, and protecting her, enabling her to fulfill her, what she's been created by God to be. There was a man who took his wife to the doctor, and he says, Doc, you've got to do something for my wife. He says, what's the matter? I don't know, there's just something wrong with her. So he you know, checked all her vitals, he read a blood panel, he did all kinds of stuff, all the tests came back, I mean, she was a picture of health. And uh, he says, no, there's just something wrong with her. He just, the doctor looked at her for a minute, walked over to her, gave her this great big old long hug, gave her a big fat kiss on the cheek, and, well, her countenance brightened, her color came back into her face, and the doctor said, Sir, that's all she needs. He says, that's all she needs? That's all she needs right there. He says, okay, well, I'll have her back in here every Tuesday and Thursday then if that's what she needs. <laughs> Husbands, you're going to be the student of your wife's needs and the meter, the meter of those needs. That's going to take time. It's going to take dedication. You need to talk to her. Tell her how you feel. Listen to her. Take notes. Pay attention. Your role is the role of Christ in the, in the skit called your marriage. You play the role. Christ met the needs of the church. Christ knew the needs of the church. Christ laid down his needs and his rights for the sake of the church. This is how marriage works. It doesn't work any other way. That's your job. And you can't do her job and she can't do your job. But if we fulfill our roles, marriage is a beautiful thing. Husband has, as I said, the hardest job because he plays the role of Savior. You play the role of Jesus in the skit called your marriage. It is a leading role. It is. So, swallow hard. Get up and do it. By God's grace. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for the great challenge we see so it's such a different perspective on marriage than we're hearing certainly in our culture, even in our churches. We have to come back to your word. And this isn't just one, one of many ways to do it. This is the only way for it to go right. Thank you for teaching us, God. Help us to take it to heart. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptistchurch.org.